Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with chess players, personalities, authors, and adult improvers about their lives, their careers, and about chess improvement. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to Perpetual Chess. This is a bit of an overdue adult improver edition. So for listeners who are relatively new to the podcast occasionally, and um, we take a break from talking about people's lives um, and careers and uh, focus more on chess improvement. And we always try to find uh, adult chess enthusiasts who have made good strides in their chess game. And this week, we have a great one joining us. Uh, He is a successful entrepreneur to uh, hardcore chess fans. He is well known for being featured in the great book Chess for Life by Grandmaster Matthew Sodler and Natasha Regan, who, of course, also wrote Game Changer and have been on Perpetual Chess. Um, and his his accomplishments were featured in that. Um, he came. He is one of these many adults who has been in and out of chess, or at least had periods of um, more activity and less activity. But in 2007, he came back to chess with a vengeance, with a rating of around 2150. Fide. And over the next five to six years, he took his rating to a peak of 2331 and earned the FM title. And he's still playing actively as well. So he's here to tell us um, all of his chess secrets. So FM Terry Chapman, thank you for joining us. Thank you. So I'm excited to have you on the show. Um, you're someone I've been hoping to speak to for a long time, so I want to first of all thank uh, GM Sadler and Natasha Regan for for putting us in touch, and I wanted to congratulate you on the success you've had. We've got a lot of chess uh, adult chess enthusiasts who are always looking for improvement tips, and it, it strikes me that you may have a few, Terry. Well, I don't know, Ben, but um, I, I appreciate your interest in me for the podcast. Um, I'm very glad to be here. And yeah. It's a fascinating subject. Our, our, our struggles to um, perform well at the chessboard is, is a richly interesting topic. Um, so I'll say what I can. Excellent. Yeah, it is. It is an interesting topic. I mean, it's it's so hard to separate the art from the science of chess improvement. Um, and I think that's why it's something that, that on this show in particular, one can spend so much time uh, discussing. Um, but before we get to all that you did for improvement, Terry, could you just tell us a little bit about, about your professional and life background and what brought you back to chess in 2007? Um, sure. Well, um, I founded an IT business when, when I was 30, um, so most of my energy went into running that um, for about 15 years, um, and, and at the same time I was married, my two children were, 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 were growing up, um, and um, the business had a lot of, a lot of success, but uh, ended rather un, unhappily um, at the end of the, um, the, 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 the uh, internet um, the internet boom um, around about 2000. And, and two, um, and um, since then I haven't really got back to to business. Um, I, I was um, quite excited about seeing what else was out there in life apart from just working all the time. And it seemed a one-dimensional life, and I, w- I was looking forward to um, I- exploring, I don't know, cultural life and travel and and sports. And and chess wasn't even top of my list to begin with, although I, I played a lot. Um, as a teenager, um, but um, after a while, I, I started playing playing chess again, and, and I was really um, surprised and delighted how much I was enjoying it, and, and uh, got back into it again. Okay, yeah, and you mentioned in your interview in Chess for Life that you were you were also having some sort of uh, personal tumult at the time, or at least something that made chess a, a bit of an escape for you. Well, that yes, the trigger, the, the immediate trigger was a was a personal crisis, and it was like, well, what do I do now? <laughs> I've got Easter coming up, got nothing to do at Easter. I'm on my own again, um, just separated um, from someone I was very fond of, and and uh, yeah, chess chess was a great resource at, at the time, and and I went to play in a four day tournament over Easter, and um, I was very rusty, of course, but. Somehow I found myself in the last round um, with, with a chance of winning the tournament. I, I didn't win the tournament, but uh, 
I did very much enjoy it. Um, so I entered another one and, and um, it carried on from there. Yeah, that can be the beauty and the curse of chess, of course. It can be a wonderful escape if you're having problems in your personal life because it has that unique ability to just transport you to a place where you think about nothing else, as uh, Chief Grandmaster Jonathan Rousen has written about so eloquently. But of course, that can also be a problem if someone's spending their whole life playing chess and just using it as an escape. That that can... uh, can lead to an imbalanced life. So w- once you came back to chess and you found it as an escape, do you feel like you were able to put it in its in its proper context? Yes, I, I, I do. I, I don't want to um, to give the impression that, that I think of chess as an escape. Or, or uh, the, the, the trigger was um, was it was at a difficult um, a difficult time in my in my life. Um, but um, it's 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 a much richer resource and a much more positive um, part of my life than, than calling it an escape um, makes it. I don't at all think of chess just just as escapism or really I don't think of it as escapism at all. You know, I enjoy it for, for all sorts of reasons and, and uh, I, I, I happily choose to spend a, a good deal of my energy and time um, play, playing chess. Yes, yes, and I, I personally don't even think of escapism as like having a negative context, but but I get where you're saying. I mean, it's right. it's it can chess provides great joy to to many of us. So once you got back into it, Terry, and once it once you were were your your um enthusiasm was reignited, uh, how did you begin to wrap your head around the topic of what to do to get better at chess? Well, um. The thing is, the last time I really worked on chess was when I was a teenager. I, 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 worked, I, I was just delighted with chess when I was 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. But a, a lot has changed since then. And, and, and the, the resources available to work on chess nowadays are infinitely richer and more useful than they were in those days. You know, there are so many uh, wonderful chess books and, and there are wonderful online resources and, and there's, there's the computer engines and the, the databases. So, so sort of, um, the information on how to play chess is out there and it's, it's available if, if you can get at it. Um, so so uh, it's just a, 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 different, um, a different world really um, in terms of chess improvements. I mean, in, in, in those days, it was a question of going down to the library and what chess books were in the library and there weren't very many. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And these days, I mean, and this, of course, you, you began from, from looking at your FIDE rating graph, your, your comeback began in earnest in 2007. Um, yes. So, and of course, chess technology has grown by leaps and bounds, even in the intervening 13 years. I mean, there was already a lot more resources then, but now, now it's, it's multiplied even more. It has, but it was. You know, if you compare um, 1970 to 2007, that, that's already an enormous gulf. So, in, in 1970, the Soviet Union was was really significantly ahead of the rest of the world in terms of chess knowledge, and 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 um, um, I, I think that, um, not all of it was was available to to the rest. Not everything they knew about chess was available whereas now any any um, ambitious youngster in India or in China or in the states or in Europe can um, it's there it's there um, at, at the click of a button so uh, you, you can you can sign on and hear the world champion talking about his thought process dur- yeah. during a chess game I mean how, how wonderful is that um, yeah it's just amazing and, and Terry in, in what year were you born 56 okay you know in in another context, I might be shy about asking that, but since it's always on anyone's FIDE page anyway, I, I figure sure, no problem. <laughs> pe- people people can't hide it. Even chess players can't hide it, even if they want to. So so fifty six. I'm very excited. I'm I'm sixty three, and and my next birthday, um, I turn sixty four, which I've decided should be a really good year for. A yeah, chess exactly. Yeah, but of course, uh, chess lovers uh, always love that uh, as well as love that number as well as Beatles fans. Um, so exactly. <laughs> so 2007, you would have been 51 when you came back. Um, and how did you feel over the board? Did you feel like you were reasonably sharp when you first uh, went to this first four day tournament in um, uh, over Easter weekend that you mentioned? Um, well, that's hard to remember. I, I, I guess um, the early games must must have gone 
Okay, I, I was playing rusty openings like King's Indian Attacks and Retis, uh, um, positions that don't require um, any theory. I was, I was playing Perk Defences, um, which I'd learned a little about 30 years earlier but didn't really remember any theory. So somehow it, it wasn't too... Somehow it wasn't too bad. Um, I, I guess when you, you do something a lot, when you're quite young, um, you, 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 know, you, you keep some reasonably, some reasonably healthy instincts at least. Um, so um, the starting point didn't seem didn't seem too bad, and the result was was reasonably encouraging. Good. And then, what did you decide to study first? What did you what what piqued your interest in the chess world? Did you work on openings? I know you mentioned in Chess for Life you were a fan of uh, some videos online. I um, focused on openings quite a bit, I'd say. I'm, I'm throwing my mind back. Now, you're, this is 13 years ago, uh, I guess. Uh, gosh, <laughs> that's a long time al already. I, I certainly put in a, a good deal of time um, on, on, on openings from, from books and um, from, from the databases um, and uh, did some work on putting together a, a reasonable repertoire. Um, unfortunately, some, some of that effort wasn't wasn't terribly well focused because because I didn't I didn't make the very best choices about which lines to um, which lines to play and uh, if I'd had a, a coach directing that right at the beginning that would have been a very good in, investment I, I, I think be, becoming really expert in some secondary line is not is not a good long term bet for your chess for your chess career but but all, all the same I, I did tend to work with with. Um, databases and, and computers and, and um, using the reference function of, of, of chess base to, to play through master games in, in the lines I was choosing and trying to, trying to work out um, what, I was, what I was going to play. And um, it's, quite, it's quite enjoyable work, and, and I certainly made some, you know, made some progress. Um, um, and gra gradually my, my repertoire took, took shape, step, step by step, I'd say. Okay. Step by step. And for listeners who aren't as familiar with chess base, basically you can call up any position from a given opening, and then if you press reference, it will show you all of the master and grandmaster games. So uh, for those of you who have chess base or use an online database, it can be a good way to to learn from the greats. That's right, and uh, it's a wonderful feature, isn't it? And, and it's just so interesting when you've when you've stared at a position in a tournament and tried to work out how to play it. You can you can get home and look it up and see how some of the best players in the world have dealt with it. It's just such a richly interesting um, experience. So um, it's, you know, it's part of the enjoyment of chess that that, um, that that kind of thing is available. Yeah, I, I agree. And we have a question from a friend and supporter of the podcast, uh, Patreon supporter Chris Wainscott, um, who related to opening. So I thought I would throw it in here now. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, sure. Chris wrote in and said, uh, Ben Larson once famously said, if you play the Carol Khan when you're young, what will you play when you're older? Fred Wilson, who famously became a master after turning 70, still plays and loves the King's Indian. And for listeners, you can Fred Wilson has been on the show. Um, you can uh, take a listen to that in the archive if you're interested. And then Chris says, with clearly competing schools of thought amongst the general playing public, do you believe in the school of thought that as one ages, they should look to change their repertoire for age-related reasons? That's a really interesting question. Actually, it's never... Um Never occurred to me um, to. But the question has never even even occurred to me, really. Let alone acting on it to to vary my or to, my repertoire because because I'm getting uh, old, older. Um, I, I um, um, actually um, to, talking of the Karakan, I took up the Karakan a, a, a few years ago, and I, I was hoping um, to some extent for a quieter life and, and more <laughs> more structured positions and. Less mayhem, but in, in fact, um, the Karakan can become outrageously sharp um, nowadays. Um, and those positions in the classical Karakan were black castles, kingside and white castles, queenside, um, they're, they're um, as complex as, uh, as, as, most, um, as most, most chess openings can, can, can lead to. Um, 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 and funnily enough, I've heard, I've heard a, a, a similar quote ra raised um, on the uh, the, the Queen's Gambit um, exchange positions, where, where uh, the, the Carlsbad structures, where White plays CD and Black plays Black plays ED, and, and White White plays positionally to go after pawn weaknesses on the Queen side, and 
I remember reading someone say, well, if you're going to do that when you're young, what are you going to do when, yeah, you're, yeah. when, when you're older? Um, no, I, as, an, as an older player, I just, I, I, I'm only focused on, um, on getting my repertoire better, better and better. And, and part of my effort nowadays is remedying um, bad, bad decisions I made maybe 10 years ago. So I, I've been trying to think longer term and think, well, you know, with, with a bit of luck, I'll still be enjoying chess and playing tournament chess for for a good few more years. So it, it, it's worth um, introducing significant new new systems and, and letting it, even if it takes a year or two to to come to understand them well and for them, for them to bed down in my own in, in my own play, um, that'll that'll still be worth it as, as a long term um, in, in investment. So, um, so so as I get older, that's hopefully. You know, I can end up at some point with the best repertoire I've, I've ever had. That's <laughs> that's the plan, anyway. That's a good goal, and it's good that you don't you don't let your age dictate your repertoire. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure why it would. I I I don't not sure why why it would really. Well, yeah, I mean, I've had guests such as uh, Grandmaster Ben Feingold. He likes to joke around about old man chess, um, <laughs> where uh-huh. when you're playing kids in particular, you might try to steer towards a uh, a more positional, uh, less tactical line. So I think that's sort of what Chris is getting at in his question. Well, that might be very sensible against against kids. I'm, I'm focusing mainly on over 50s events. Oh, um, good for you. At, at the moment, I'm playing British over 50s, European over 50s, world over 50s, and 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 trying to, and I'm enjoying uh, that circuit um, very much. And uh, Ashley didn't have such a such a bad year uh, last year, um, uh, so that that um, eliminates the, the problem of, of playing against very young players. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, I'm 43, and I'm looking forward to being able to play senior events uh, down the line. And it, um, yeah, well, I, I, I I'm. Um, I'm finding it a you know very very positive journey um, playing playing in those events. Yeah. Um, so you've mentioned in the Chess for Life interview that you've worked with various coaches over the years. Um, is are you still working with coaches today, Terry? No, not. Uh, well, I say that um, um, only to a limited I- I- extent. Um, I, I'm 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 aiming to play about pretty significant tournaments a year at the moment which is which is somewhat less than than i was doing five five years ago and and in the run-up to each tournament i've i've been arranging uh, a coaching session with uh john spielman who lives quite close to me here in here in london and um i see it more as an inspiration session to just just to open my mind to more possibilities than than I naturally see myself because he's such a genius and yeah. his mind overflows with strategic and tactical ideas and, and looking at chess positions with him is, is, is a privilege and, and, and it's kind of mind expanding. So, so um, um, uh, I, I arranged sort of an, an afternoon with him before each of my last few tournaments and that, that's been a pleasure and quite, use, quite useful, I think. I think it does achieve, it does achieve something for me. Um, it, it gives me a, some kind of goal to aim at of better chess you know he, he sees more more quickly than i do and uh, and it's in, it's an inspiration to to um to think about chess like that with him um just before a tournament yeah i mean that's got to be it's got to be incredible to to take lessons with a, a british chess legend such as gm spielman yeah I mean, he, he was a world championship uh contender wasn't he he played um not in the final of course but in the candidates um he, he uh He's an ex- extraordinary talent. So what sort of, so you mentioned that, of course, it's inspirational just to see him analyze. Uh, what would a typical lesson with him be like? Would you would you look at a game or go over an opening or would he show you some some studies or, or all of the above? Yeah, well, you know, but sadly, you know, the time passes quickly. I mean, we, you know, um, we, I, I take down um, maybe an opening line I'd like to look at with him and, and a couple of end games I've, which I've, played and found interesting and haven't really analyzed them um, in much detail myself something something like that and 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 um we'll we'll, we'll do um um you know we'll we'll, we'll look at um, a particular line of say the king's indian defense or the modern or the modern defense or the time on of sicilian or or something like that and and and, and 
uh, and to just try to get a feel for for how the how the play goes and and w- without trying to reach some kind of theoretical perfection because oh, you can do that with databases and computers it's more a question of feel and, and how he reacts and how he, he senses it and, and trying to improve my own my own feeling for the openings i i play um and then of course john spielman is a great endgame player and, and we always look at a couple of endgame positions as well and again i'm i'm just trying to i'm, I'm hoping some of his feeling for endgames will, will rub off onto me yeah yeah uh... <laughs> but on the one hand um working with him the time absolutely whizzes by and on the other hand it's it's um very exhausting so after three hours um I, i'm ready i'm ready for a break <laughs> yeah that that makes sense i mean uh you, someone like that i can't imagine trying to trying to keep up with him calculating even if uh grandmaster spielman is like the rest of us not as young as he once was i'm sure it's still uh still a challenge it's a cascade of ideas um yeah so but that's all. That's all the coaching um, I've been doing for um, some time now. Okay. Um, so I've got another question from a supporter of the podcast. But first, we're going to take a quick break to hear from our friends at Chessable. Guys, I don't want to spoil it, but later in this interview, you're going to hear FM Terry Chapman talk about the extreme importance of tactics as a daily ritual in order to maintain and improve your chess level as an adult improver. So if you're interested in doing that for yourself, chessable.com has you covered. They've got tactics books for all levels. So if you're relatively new to chess, you could check out the Mastering Mate series. If you're a club level player, below 1800 or so you could check out tactics time it'll keep you busy for a long time and if you're an advanced player and looking to get even more advanced then of course there is the famous woodpecker method so whatever your level if you want to work on tactics on a daily basis and get a chessable streak going head over to chessable and check it out Okay, Terry. So our next question, we actually got a few from a friend and supporter of the podcast, uh, Han Shu himself, uh, a 50 something chess player who's continuing to improve. Um, and this is, uh, so I'll, um, I, I broke it up into different parts, but I'll start with this question from Han. Uh, he asks, he says, your interview in Chess for Life was for me the most useful interview in the book. Great, honest reflection on how to get back into the game around 50 and great practical tips. Thanks. And here's his first question. He said, is time trouble still one of your enemies and has the frequency of oversight stabilized in the last three years? As you discuss yeah, both um, of these issues in uh, Chess for Life, I think time trouble will always be something I I wrestle with. I'm I'm naturally um, indecisive and uh, and perfectionist, um, and um, despite that, I would say it has improved somewhat in the last eighteen months or or two years. Um, I, I like I like the idea of, of trying to play a game as though you have to make all your moves in one hour. And I, I just, I try to move to that rhythm. And, and although I don't, of course, in a, in a, in a full, full international time limit game, it's, it's, it's helpful. Um, it's a helpful thought to have in your, in your mind to keep, to keep you moving ra- rather than spending forever trying to decide between two, two sort of complex equals, if you, if you like, which can, which can happen. Um, and I, I think if I look at the last 18 months or so, which have, which have gone quite, quite well, um, I think I've become steadier when time trouble approaches, a, a little more confident that I'll be able to, um, but I'll, I'll be able to make, make reasonable decisions reasonably quickly. And what one, one reason for that is that I've, I've been working quite regularly on a, database um of of positions which chessbase offers um tactics uh the tactics database of chessbase and um and some sometimes when when i'm concentrated and when i'm focused and working on a complex position it it's it's it surprises me how much how much work can get done and how 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 fully you can you can analyze a, a position in in just just three minutes or or two to four minutes. It's um, 
I mean, not not always. Sometimes I'm dawdling and drinking coffee, and my mind is jumping around, and it's hard to get a get a focus. But but sometimes I, I think I've taken ages, and no, I haven't taken ages. I've only taken three minutes, and I've basically um sold it. And, and that that kind of daily daily work has given me a little bit more a bit more confidence. But if I'm if I'm um, thinking steadily and and calmly, um, if, even though I'm beginning to run into moderate time trouble, I'll I'll, I'll be able to get you know, to, to get a reasonable process um, done and a reasonable move made. So some, some slight improvements on that one. It'll, it'll always be um, one of my chess challenges. Well, that's heartening to hear that you've made progress because certainly a lot of people struggle with it, myself included. And um, so it sounds like you kind of waged a multi-front war where you're you're able to move faster but also just play better in time trouble. Um, and you mentioned... Uh, that part of your daily practice is tactics, and you think that that has helped. Um, could you speak to in in chess for life? You mention a uh, a um, propensity for blundering, which I think becomes yes. you know no chess player is immune. But I think as as yep. one gets older, it becomes increasingly common. I actually uh, highlighted a quote that I'll find uh, from the book. Um, sorry, just I think it will be. Uh, Oh, uh, you you mentioned a game against Zhukova where you say you start you had a good position and you then uh, yep, yep, made incomprehensibly yep. bad moves from a clear blue sky. Yep. Yes, just very bad short short calculation, just not not seeing two two and a half moves ahead um, with any kind of accuracy. Um, yeah. Well, um, um, the good news is um, I, I think. Um, I've improved um, in terms of not blundering and in terms of short calculation. Not 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 radically, perhaps, not, but um, but um, distinctly. And uh, the reason is uh, that about eighteen months or two years ago, I discovered this tactics base database, um, tactics.chessbase.com, which which offers tens of thousands of graded um, uh, puzzles to 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 solve um and i've got into the habit of beginning every day uh, with 15 minutes at least of of solving positions which i very much enjoy actually it's a it's it's a kind of calmly concentrated um beginning to beginning to the day and and and, and um a sort of chess player's meditation if you like um j- just uh, uh, bring your mind to bear on these on these positions and and i found Found it a very motivating way to work on positions, much more useful than working on positions in in magazines. Um, partly because it's it's rigorous and precise. If you if you get a position wrong, um, it says not the best move in the position, and you lose a shed load of rating points, which <laughs> is which is very painful. So you get you get negative feedback if you make a bad decision, which is exactly what happens in a real game of real game of, of chess so it, it, it better replicates the, the position you find yourself in a chess game than solving a position from, from a magazine um, and um, to, for that, partly for that reason it's, it's, it's very very good um, good training you, you, you want to uh, um, make the right decision because it's painful to make the wrong decision and that's what happens um, that, that's what happens playing chess and you, you want your rating to go up all, all these positions are dynamically rated so if you if you solve a position its rating goes down slightly if you if you beat a position if, uh, if you lose to it its rating goes up because it's been proven to be more difficult so the the position ratings are not arbitrary um a, a, at all um and and it's kind of um an exercise in determination as well as in concentration. So once you start a position, you're determined to do your utmost to make the right decision. And there's only one right decision. And I, I think that that kind of practice in being determined also also is very good training for what actually happens at the, at the chessboard. Whereas before I, I discovered this, I, w- I would be solving pages of positions from books and magazines and so on. And I'd be turning to the solutions and and i'd see i had two moves in the right idea but slightly in the wrong order or something and i'd tell myself oh well never mind i would have got it in the right order if it had been a real game and no you know no no there, there was a degree of slackness or imprecision in my thinking and and um and i might well have 
been slack in and over the board game as as well. So um, uh, so of, of all the resources I've I've discovered relatively recently, this, this has been by far the most um, useful. Well, those are some great recommendations, and they um, they they echo some things that GM Jakob Agard recently said on the show. Number one, the importance of daily practice. Uh, as he yep. mentioned, even even as you say, 15 minutes a day, just the fact that you're doing yep. it every day can make a big difference. And well, I, I double. I, if, I, if I've got a tournament coming up, then, then I'll do, do double. So it'll rather than being 15 to 30 minutes, it'll be half an hour to it'll be half an hour to an hour. Um, and and um, I do it before I do anything else. So I, I won't let myself sort of philosophize about chess or think about openings or or work on anything unless I've done some chess, which is sort of actually because that is what we do as chess players. We have to take responsibility for making decisions. And there you are. The, the great thing about this um, database is that once you've got a position up, you, you're there. You know, if, if you, you can't switch the computer off or just go and do something else, because if you don't, if you don't put in a response, it will um, tell you that you haven't solved it and, and mark you down. Um, um, so, um, but there's also kind of an accumulating confidence from working on it, because day by day you're, you're, you're solving, but mostly you, you get them right. And, and so it's, it's an experience of making correct decisions day after day after day. And as an underconfident player in, in, in general, I, I found that help, helpful um, to, to, to be playing. And, and I can remember specific games I've played in the last year when I've, I've, I've been in a, a mazy tactical situation and I thought to myself, no, this is, this is within my capabilities. I know I can get these right because I've correctly solved thousands of positions um, of, of equivalent complexity on the tactics database. And, and, and so, so it plays in, it's played into a sort of slightly steadier presence at the chessboard, I think. That's, that's great to hear. And Terry, do you mind shedding a little more light um, on your general study regimen, both as as you when you were playing even more um, in the period covered in Chess for Life and now? So you're doing tactics every day. Uh, what else do you like to? You've mentioned, of course, your database work on openings. Uh, what would a typical day be like for you, and how many hours per week do you think you're spending studying chess? Right, right. Well, I I I do um, no work. Um, on chess um, at all, unless I've got a tournament coming up. So, so my even my, the course, sorry to cut uh, you off, but even the daily tactics practice that's only in. Oh, sorry, but I, no, I do the daily tactics practice every every day that I can, which is which is most nearly every day I do that. Okay, yes, nearly every day. I, I I'm sorry, I, that's right. But otherwise, um, um, my, my my rightly or wrongly, my 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 approach for the last year or two. Has been to um, plan to plan a, a, a program for the year with three significant tournaments and maybe a couple of weekend tournaments. And then, if I if I have a significant tournament coming up, I, I will work hard on my chess for about a month beforehand. And I'll be doing five, six, seven hours um, a day for a month before a tournament. And that's that kind of is my chess program for the year because that's a significant commitment four weeks of preparation two weeks playing the tournament then then um some time to review what happened afterwards um and i, I think that's um that feels about right in terms of the place of chess in my life at, at um at, at this stage um so um so in fact in principle I, I should have a tournament coming up in poland the european over 50s championship in a month time and I, i've just been thinking about um, what I want to focus on for, for this one. But, but of course, we're, we're living in extraordinary really times are. at the moment with, with the coronavirus. And um, I, I noticed that uh, there's a tournament in Reykjavik, which has just been cancelled, which is um, also was due to start in, in April. Um, I noticed that um, Rajabov has pulled out of, pulled out of the candidates and, and, and um, four, four members of the England senior team pulled out of, of the, the world seniors which, which is in progress at the moment in in progress so obviously this year's program might might be very um disrupted um so so what i'm telling you is what i was what i was um planning until until very recently but unfortunately um there's there's obviously scope for some of the events i want to 
I want to play in to be to be postponed. I, I'd be surprised if this tournament in Poland in April is not um, postponed. Um, the way things are looking at the moment. Um, yeah. Um, um, but but yeah. I, I mean, um, would it be helpful to talk um, a little about the sorts of things I would I would be doing? Yes, absolutely. For the tournament. Um, I mean, it, it it begins with going through my own games um, over the last couple of years. Even if I've gone through them all, all, already, I, I find looking at old notes somehow doesn't doesn't do the trick. You need a you need a sort of fresh a fresh look, and, and you need to you need a fresh feeling for sort of what what, what went wrong and what um, and what you want to work on. So I, I begin by going go, going over it, um, a couple of years worth of. Of, of, of games um, and there, there might be um, weaknesses in specific weaknesses in openings for example where you know a lot of lines need repairing that's the most um, the most obvious sort of thing or um, oh I don't know I, I might I might have an old an old um, tendency to overvalue the, the two bishops and I see I've made a move where where I overvalued the two bishops um, again and, and mis- misevaluated um, uh, the right move, so I'll, I'll make a note of that and, 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 and hope to be able to compensate that for that uh, an, another time. Or, or for, for some reason, I, I have a weakness for rook end games. I, I steer myself towards rook end games as though they're some kind of comfort zone, and as though I can play them. And, and, and um, you know, several several times, um, I've I've found myself doing that when it was it was a, a poor choice. Um, so. Um, identifying that kind of that kind of suboptimal tendency and 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 hoping to be able to correct for it um uh, another time um so there's all, i mean there's all sorts of things that that can come out of of looking at um of looking at your own uh g- games um and um and that's the first that's the first step um then then stepping up the tactics work i was talking about um is, is another step, um, but there tend not to be very many endgame positions in those in, in those in that database. So um, um, I, I would try to find a um, a book of endgame positions, for example, um, which I could work on in in parallel to sort of balance out the work that I'm doing. There's a very good book of positions by Edward. I think it's called Endgame Calculation, um, mm-hmm. which I spent a lot of time on before my last my last tournament. Um, um i i enjoy um updating uh, uh opening so um for example the the um new in chess yearbook um has dozens of articles of 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 um new ideas or new new trends in openings and of of those in any in any given volume there might be six seven eight which are relevant to my Repertoire, and it, you know, it'll, it'll say something like, "Hey, how about playing the Queasy Two Line against the Slav?" It, it's, um, it, it, and it'll give three, four pages of analysis and some recent games, and and um, and um, I, I might think, well, my anti-Slav repertoire is is ready for some refreshment and, and play through it and make some notes and and look at some games and and be ready to play the, the, play play that line next time I face the Slav, but. but the, the great thing being that um, it'll be new, and no one will be expecting me to to play it because we we can't just go on playing the same line every time we turn up at the tournament. Of of course, because um, we get uh, we get prepared for. Um, so so something I do is I, I take maybe half a dozen recent volumes of the new in chess yearbook, and I I trawl through them for interesting ideas and 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 spend. Um, and, and spend some time um, integrating the most interesting ones into my into my repertoire and being being ready to to um, to, to sort of wheel wheel them out when when a tournament game come comes up. So so then the tournament starts and I look at my opponent and he's devoted to playing to playing the Grunfeld say and and there's been an interesting essay about this new knight H4 line against the the Grunfeld. So um, so I'll I'll be able to look up my notes and and I'll be be well prepared to play something that I haven't played before. That, that, that's um, an important um, part of it, um, and that, that's one of the things I do um, in the run-up to in the run-up to a tournament. Um, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll play um, 
a couple of sparring games. Uh, one or two chess friends, a bit stronger than I am, and 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 um, obviously because of because of the rhythm of my chess and the fact that I'm not playing, um, I'm not playing all through the year, but 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 focusing on just three events, like there's a risk of getting rusty. So playing playing training games um, at a slow time limit um, um, is an important um, important part of it. Um, and then, then there's there's kind of things things I do just for inspiration, um, just to kind of try and enlarge my my picture rather rather than shrink my my understanding of chess, but just trying to expand it as a tournament approaches. What one one of those things is is, is the session with John Spielman, which I've already already talked about. Um, but but for another example, um, the new in chess magazine every um, Every edition of Chess Magazine, um, there's an interview with a chess player, and the chess player is always asked, "What's the most exciting game of chess you ever saw?" So, in a, so that's going to be an interesting game, isn't it? Because you're, you're talking about a professional player. Maybe he's been a professional for decades. This is the most exciting game he's ever seen. That's going to be a game worth worth playing through, isn't it? So, um, so I look those up, and I, I play through maybe a couple of dozen of them and and obviously that's extremely enjoyable work because the chess is simply yeah. <laughs> fantastic um but it's also very inspiring because it, it 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 sort of expands your understanding of what of what can happen at the at the chessboard um um so those are some of the things yeah and for listeners who aren't subscribed to new in chess you immediately should subscribe uh just an incredible breadth of information um uh, great interviews, great book reviews by your friend GM Matthew Sadler, and great coverage of all the major events and opening novelties, and so on and so forth. So can't can't recommend that high, highly enough. Or you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I I couldn't fault it. it. It's a magazine of of the highest of the highest quality. Um, yeah, beautiful magazine. Very very too. very very professional. Yeah. 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 Um, and Terry, in, in hearing you talk about openings, it reminded me that in the interview, um, of course, you mentioned that you feel like one of your strengths as a player, at least at the time that the book came out, was that you, you, um, you're very strong at openings. You feel like, um, let's see, uh, here's your quote, a diligent amateur can reach a, prep- a preparation la- level of 25 to 2600, even if his calculation and strategy is way below that. That's probably quite a common profile. It was certainly mine. Um, so I found that interesting juxtaposing that with your discussion of uh, the challenges of memorizing things and how you didn't feel like you had an amazing memory. How, so how were you able to sort of uh, square those competing um, issues for a chess player? Well, that's a very good question. And thank God it is possible to square those things up to a point. And the reason is that um, you, the way it works is this. You, you've, you've prepared a certain line against the Grunfeld, say, to to a very high to a very high standard. Um, a tournament starts, then then the day before a game, you, you find out who your opponent is the next day, um, around about, say, 9 o'clock in the evening, and you've, t- you've got until the following afternoon to play them. Uh, so the first thing you do is you, you check them out, what kind of player are they, um, try and get a sense of, of their preferences, but also their specific repertoire, and... Um, you, you might um, you might find they have two possible defences as as black, and so you prepare for their for their two possible defences. And that means that on the day of the game, you can revise and review um, all all the work that you've done from your from your repertoire notes um, from your repertoire database. And and that that is how it's possible to to remember if if. Um, Otherwise, I wouldn't wouldn't be able to usefully remember a great deal of the work um, that, that I do. Um, but um, play, players are, are predictable, and and um, it is possible to to land to land preparation reasonably, you know, reasonably often. 
Okay. So that is definitely a uh, good advice for someone in your situation where you're playing some closed events and your pairings are posted in advance. But I'm guessing some people listening who play a lot of these weekend Swisses, especially the, the frenetic American style ones, um, might not be able to replicate that because often you only find out no. your opponent like 10 minutes no. before. And, and be- because my memory is, is, is poor, that, that is one reason why in principle, I, I prefer these, these slower sort of international rate one, one game a day tournaments and, and I, I, I like because I, I feel it's a it's a strength of mine and and, and, and I'm quite organized in, in using using that time to be ready for a specific op- opponent and and um, uh, if, if it's a question of a weekend tournament then I think for me the um, the thing to do would would be to spend time a couple of days before the tournament quickly um, reviewing okay, these are my latest ideas against the Slavs, these are my latest ideas against the King's Indian, these are my latest ideas in the Catalan, and, and, and so on. And, and um, just, just revising, if you like, um, um, the work that I might have done just, just um, you know, spasmodically o- over the previous you know, year or two, really. Um, um, and uh, that, that, would, that, would be a lot better than, that would be a lot better than nothing. Yeah, that makes sense, and that that's good advice. Um, so, when you study openings, are you making a conscious effort to memorize lines, or, or are you focused more on understanding the ideas of the opening? Um, um, well, it it, uh, it goes in stages. Uh, I guess the first thing to do for for anybody is is to get some um, to get a sense of of how to play the positions um i get that begins maybe with books that introduce an an opening um then you can play through games by by good players who've who, who play the opening and and see how they play them and and you, you're just trying to get a general understanding and then and then the next stage is is maybe to get um an advanced book by i don't know you know catronius or mckinsey or, or, or whoever it is and 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 um ha- have a concrete detailed repertoire for the for, for the main for the main lines, and then the next stage again is is to look at these latest articles um, and and um, uh, uh, um, for example, or, or, or there are other ways of doing it, of course, to to, to um, keep in touch with, with new ideas and um, um, and um, but all, but all these these all tend to get annotated in a repertoire basis, but uh, uh, repertoire database. Sorry, so so the the, the all, all these all this work kind of gets consolidated into a repertoire database. Um, so um, for, for, for every line I have, a, I have lines in my database and, and there are moves there, but there are also quite extensive commentaries where I'm, I'm trying to remind myself um, of why the moves are played and, and, and um, what's going on in the, in the position. So, so I, I, I know there might be, I, I, know, I know that I'm capable of forgetting it. And of course, chess is, infinitely complex so um they're just they're just so so much of it so I, I i try to set out the information um in a form that it can be quickly revised before a game okay uh, excellent advice um and you've mentioned uh, a couple books along the way roman edwards uh calculation and game calculation book his books are yep. for quite advanced yep players do you do you have any uh what other books might you recommend and and for for what approximate level do you think yeah um yes the, the edward book um um some of some of it is accessible and then um the positions get more and more difficult and and in fact i i, I began to he, he marked some of the positions as difficult and towards the end of the book I just ignored them because I, I, I think he, he was selecting positions that he personally found interesting and challenging and, and which you know world champion level players had got wrong and, and um, uh, just beyond really um, um, uh, books I, I thought the Argyle books on attacking were were, were wonderful um, I, I, um, I thought Hawkins, Hawkins book on becoming an IM of course he's become a GM since then um was was particularly useful um, in 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 him talking about how how he how he improved. Um, I mean, I, I suppose if you're ambitious and and hardworking, it must it must be likely that the Kasparov books are the, are the best chess books 
ever. I mean, cumulatively, yeah. those books I would have thought must, they must be the best books ever ever written. There's just an absolute colossal um, source of chess expertise from the greatest, you know, su- such a great player, such a great world champion, and and, and um, he so much energy of his after he retired went into that book. Um, so um, you'd have to have to recommend them, and uh, and and um, I guess someone could could learn an absolutely enormous amount about chess just just from spending time on on Kasparov's books um but then it's not it's not just books nowadays is it i mean for example my um my chess base 15 it, it turned out it, it came with um with a database entitled um best games for replay training yeah um so i thought okay that looks interesting I, I mean, presumably everybody who has chess base has has this database it seems to come Pre with it, and 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 um, but there, there's a, a, a good number. Somebody has selected a database of the most instructive games ever played, and it, it's a magnificent database of, of instructive and um, and beautiful and beautiful games. Um, um, so uh, you know, and also, uh, another way of doing it: just play play through those games and and pause regularly and think what. What would you do? What would you? What's going on? What do I understand about this? You know, how would I continue? And then, and then see how the game continued. And 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 um, uh, I guess the more work you, you you put in, the more the more you get out. You get out of it on on both things. Um, a bit of a cliche, but it, but it's true. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but this this question of level is is very difficult. Finding material that's the right the the, the right level. Um, for example, I think quite often you, you, you get you know, chess players are really very interesting, reflective, analytical people, and, and they write a, a subset of them write really wonderful books, terrific books. But they're writing sometimes about what they're interested in and about the results of their chess journey, and and it's pretty high level, difficult stuff. But then their publisher and they themselves, of course, they want to sell lots of copies, so they they dress it up as as you know suitable for everybody. Right? Yeah, it's true. And it's simply and it's it's a bit of a trap because it, it's just not the case that they've done something wonderful, but for a very select audience. I mean, you know, um, well beyond my level potentially. If you're, I mean, um, an example that comes to mind is um, Sokolov's book on middle game structures. I mean, I, I had a superficial look at look at it and my impression was he'd, he'd done a simply amazing uh, deep job of analyzing certain middle game structures but, but probably one which many grandmasters would benefit from studying but a book a grandmaster would benefit from studying is, is probably not a book a, you know a 1400 would benefit from studying and um, so um, or another example would be um, a, a very good book by Axel Smith I think I think that was his name, and, and it, it had a dreadful title called "Pump Up Your Rating." Oh yeah, "Pump Up Your Rating," um, which suggests that it's targeted at, at everybody, uh, but it's not. It, it's it, you know, it's a very thoughtful and reflective book uh, um, uh, uh, about sort of what he's learned about chess and, and chess improvement. But he hasn't made any effort to to kind of arrange his material in a way which will be really useful for club level players. It's it's just that somebody has put has put that. Um, title on the book um, in my opinion to in order to sell as many copies as as possible but it, it's irrelevant to the book's content yeah yeah it is an issue and uh yeah on this show i'm i'm kind of guilty of it as well because i interview a lot of uh titled players so a lot of the books they recommend end up being for for higher rated players for players maybe 2000 at minimum um and there's a lot of listeners who aspire to that level but aren't, aren't there yet um so listeners who are listening, I'll try my next adult improver interview. I'll try to get someone um, uh, at a lower rating, but still making progress. Um, and of course, we have had different recommendations uh, uh, over the over time for, for lower rated players. Uh, Grandmaster Ar- Agar discussed the Yusupov series. And of course, all the move by move books are good. And as you say, yep. the, the Kasparov books are for everyone, although he does go quite yep. heavy on the analysis. So you're probably not going to be able to yep. follow his, his calculation if you're a younger player, but you can still appreciate and learn from the games. And I would say similarly about the, uh, 
the the chest based database you mentioned, which I also have chest based fifteen, but I've been neglecting yeah. that. So I, I need to dig through that. I'm sure there's some games that that I've uh, neglected to appreciate at this point. Yeah, and it's enjoyable work, right? You know. It's, yeah, um, yeah, exactly. I mean, all, all this work, we need we need to enjoy it, don't we? Otherwise, you know, what's the point? You know, so if someone's given you this database of of some of the best games and most instructive games ever played, then it's like, you know, what's not to like? Um, what's not to like? Yeah, exactly. Um, and and uh, Terry, I just have um, a couple more topics. Are you okay for time? I'm fine for time. Excellent. Okay. So uh, getting to part two of uh, Han Schutz's question, um, and you've touched on this a bit throughout the interview that you're still active, but if you could uh, just, his question is, how did your chess involve, evolve since 2016, which is when Chess for Life came out? Do you still focus your creative energy still primarily on chess or on other things? So you, you've you discussed this some, but what's the actual, like, what's the chess update? You had reached a peak rating when the book came out, and I saw your ratings down yep. some since then, but back yep. up so, maybe a little bit. Yeah. So um, I, I play somewhat less. Uh, um, I think I was playing 70 or 80 games a year. Then I, I uh, maybe 40, maybe 40 now. Um, um, I, obviously, the way I prepare for tournaments is is broadly similar but but i do some i i, I do some some things which are, are newish for me or uh, um i mentioned i mean the banter blitz available from carlson and other people is entertaining but also um very instructive i mentioned but i mentioned the, the the position solving work which is is the single most important um innovation i've i've discovered um my 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 Results deteriorated um, steadily for quite some time after that interview. In fact, I, I see I reread that interview um, in preparation for this discussion, and I, I see there were already symptoms symptoms of um, some concern. Um, and um, I dropped about 150 points from from my peak over a three year four year period. Um, but actually, the last 18 months. Um, I've I've turned that around and and I've recovered about half of the uh, rating um, of, of the rating points I lost and I've I've had some reasonable results. I, I shared the title of the British Over Fifties Championship last summer, so oh. I am the, the joint British Over Fifties champion at the moment. Um, um, I, I did very well in the in the World Over Fifties a year ago, um, and um, last year's European Over Fifties I was I was leading it after five rounds. I had an extraordinarily good um good tournaments and very very encouraging so um it's been down 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 and then up up it's been the has been the story of the last um of the last five or six years um and uh, i don't want to be boring on this topic but but i'm pretty sure or have a strong a strong my strong theory is is that the daily work i do solving positions has been the key to turning it around so you weren't doing that when when your rating was no. going down no yeah no, i didn't discover and and particularly um this this very motivating rated way of solving positions and this very precise need you must make the best move or your rate or your you know your your rating for solving will will go will go down um they both um several positive um, aspects of that. And because what you're doing is you're practicing the, the core skill of, of chess, which is deciding what move to make. You know, it's like a tennis player hitting forehands and backhands and volleys. That, that is what we do playing, playing chess. You know, we, we, we have to make a decision and make, uh, make a move. And you're, you're, so chess, is, 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 so to that extent, it's more a skill than a knowledge base, isn't it? So, so although if you if you increase your knowledge, it feels comforting, and you you know you, you put some moves that you've learned in an opening into your database, and you feel good about it because you've got a a weapon to hit an opponent with one day, and that's that that's great. But it, it's less central, surely, to being a good chess player than than just the ability to calculate precisely and see ideas and evaluate and make and and take responsibility for for making a move. Um, and um, so so just just training doing that as a priority over absolutely anything else um, is, is, um, is what I'd recommend, I think. 
That's that's great advice, and I'm glad to hear that you've turned things back around. Uh, do you have a Do you have a goal? Well, tomorrow in- is another day. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to celebrate too soon, but but I mean, uh, at least you're trending in the right direction currently. Um, do you have a goal? Do you have like ratings goals or tiding, title goals with your current chess regimen? I do have I do have goals. Um, I do have goals. Uh, I, I, Let's see. Well, um, I, I, one of my goals was was to win the British over fifties title. Um, uh, I, I shared the title this year. I, I'd love to win it outright um, next year. Um, it, it feels just feasible to win a medal in either the European or the World over fifties, um, or if not in the over fifties, then in, then in the over sixty fives, which I'll qualify for in a couple in a couple of years. So. So one thing in my mind is if I can maintain or enhance my level as far as possible, then then um, I could be a contender in the in the over 65 events. And and I kind of think I, I prove that uh, last year in in Rhodes I had four out of four um, beat a grand master in round four. Then I I drew with um, Stuart Rua, the top seed in round five um, quite easily. I was I was leading the tournament outright beyond halfway. Um, and in the end, I, I didn't win a medal, which was by that stage it was it was a disappointing final position. But it, su- it suggests what's what's possible. So, so I have some specific ideas in in terms of results. Um, um, but the main thing is is to to enjoy the journey. I think, and I, I enjoy preparing for tournaments. I enjoy playing in them. I enjoy the work I do around it. Um, I enjoy almost everything about the chess experience, except losing chess. Games. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the the one minor detail. But but yeah, but I'm with you. Um, so last topic. Um, you mentioned beating a grandmaster recently. Congratulations. Um, in the interview, you also yeah, mentioned thanks. you also mentioned beating uh, uh British chess legend, uh, dearly departed grandmaster Tony Miles. Um, you talk about playing Kasparov and beating Kasparov in an odd simul, and all of that leads up to the it wasn't last a simul. What's that? No, it, it wasn't. A, oh, it, it wasn't, wasn't a simul. simul. It was a, Even it was a, better. It was a, 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 it was a four-game match. I, I played against him in in um, two thousand and one um, at odds of odds of two pawns, so, which I I lost two and a half, one and a half. But I did win one of the games. I'll take it. <laughs> so that that would be good enough for me. Um, Okay, and and that all feeds into the the final question from Han Shu, who again, when I interviewed him, he just he loves the book Chess for Life. And for listeners who don't know about it, it's basically it's a book of interviews with adult improvers. So I, I definitely recommend uh, listeners check that out. Um, and I agree, it's a very good book. Yeah, um, and this is uh, Han Shu's question, final question, which is uh, how is the experience of playing with world champions Kasparov and Anand and one of the candidate favorites Ding Liren? and the Pro Business Cup at the London Chess Classic. With whom did you have the best chemistry? How did you prepare? What is the format of the games, and how did the consultation during the game work? How high did you have to bid to play? Um, so this is a... Uh, well, you can you can <laughs> shed more light okay, on great. this. Yeah, let me let me talk about this. This is the annual um, Pro Biz event um, uh, where, where amateurs such as myself team up with um, an elite player and we make alternate moves the format is that you're allowed two uh breaks for one minute's consultation otherwise you're not allowed not allowed to consult so you just make um a move and he makes a move and you make a move and um it's been running for um for a few years um i in chronological order i, I played with Anand first. In, in fact, I, I've only won the event once, and it was with Anand. And playing with him was was a delight because he's a completely steady presence next to you. He, he, you just feel this calm, concentrated, um, um, un, uncritical, accepting um, presence, um, and and it, it helps you. Um, to settle down and and just um, concentrate as effectively and calmly as 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 you can. Um, um, so it was a pleasure and a, and a privilege to play with with Vichy and and we we did win. We we beat Kramnik and his partner in the in the last round in a in a very close in a very close game. Actually, I, I have a slightly embarrassing memory of playing with. 
issue because at one point during one of our games I thought we had a tactical knockout and he didn't pay it and <laughs> I looked at him questionably which which is really presumptuous isn't it to think that he could have been right. um, something but, but I'd seen but, but um, in fact as he explained to me later but the tactic had a flaw in it so, ah, okay. uh, but mo- moving on quickly from that um, then I played with uh, Kasparov twice um, uh, the year before uh, so that's 2017, 2018, and, and, and uh, both times uh, very um, interesting, um, very interesting experiences. The, the first time I, I, I played him, he he um, flew in from. He, he wanted to prepare um, the day before and, and to agree openings and to get in tune on what our repertoire was going to be, and and, um, and I went to his hotel to do some work with him in the in the evening i mean what a privilege that was yeah, right? amazing. Evening studying chess with Kaspar. um but he'd, he'd flown in from lithuania that day and then um he had he had a an interview with um a, a very um a very popular radio program here in the in the afternoon um uh, called desert island disc desert oh, island it's disc. an amazing it's podcast po- yeah um and and so gary did did that and and you know he was late for his dinner with me and 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 quite stressed from the travel and and it's it's a prominent um radio program and then then we had two absolutely um fantastic hours um just just going through, you can get through <laughs> uh go for a lot of work we'll go line after line what about this what about this what about this what about this you know and and um so we 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 sort of fleshed out the skeleton of the repertoire we were going to play as much as much as we could in the in the time, but then the next day, when when he arrived at the tournament hall, he was immediately mobbed, and he had a, he had another radio interview to do. And we were going to do another half an hour's work, um, but but um, in fact, he was giving interviews until five minutes after the game was supposed to was supposed to start. And and um, I think even if you're Gary Kasparov, even you know to play chess, you can't prepare for a game like that. You know, it, it's even if it's a, a pro am e- e- event, it, it doesn't help you to. To play good chess, you, you 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 can't just sort of switch from all that noise and all that travel and all those distractions to to you know being a being a, you know the best chess player you can be at the at, at, at the board. Um, and um, so it was a much more frenetic but but um, very privileged um, experience. Um, but then the, the next year was um, even more interesting playing with with Gary because. Um, 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 we agreed to we agreed to play again, and, and the thing is that for all the other elite players, the pro biz is, is really um, a day off, right? So um, it's 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 good fun, and it's fun for the amateurs, and you know we we we, we do our very best amateurs, um, but for the elite players, I mean they're, they're playing in the in the London Chess Classic, and 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 um, you know it's, it, the, the pro biz is a very minor event relative to that, but for Gary, who's a retired chess player. It, it, it was really important to do as well as possible and preferably to win it. He was very stressed about it and very focused about it. And, and because he's not participating in elite events and because um, I suppose it's a relatively rare playing opportunity, um, he, he, he was not at all relaxed, hmm. not at all um, calm, just the opposite of playing with... Um, with um, Vichy and and, and um, it, I found it um, quite disturbing sitting next to him, feeling feeling you know he's a very expressive man and and, and feeling the anxiety next to him. Cause, uh, I'm cause nervous all, just all, hearing you talk about it. You know, all, all, all the amateurs compare notes because you've got all the normal stress of playing a chess game, right? And then on top of that, you're thinking, well, if I really play a lemon, you know, I, I'm going to ruin Ding Yuan's position or Gary's position, <laughs> and it is a significant extra source of stress um but um playing with gary you can multiply that by um by 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 a hundred really from his body language and 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 you, it just meant so much and, and very strange i mean why would it mean so much to him all, all all that he's achieved in chess and and his amazing amazing um uh achievements uh, uh, you know at the highest level of chess in the key moments of those matches against karpov and and so on and and, and so on, and he was still he was still worked up, um, and, and um, you know, 
very, very uh, competitively oriented in, in this um, charity event. Um, um, in, um, interesting, interesting. Um, and um, but it didn't it didn't help me to to play well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't help um, me either. <laughs> and um, but and then this year I, I played with um, Ding Liren, who 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 uh, again an enormous um, privilege and. Um, and um, very calm uh, presence and, and very um, generous where he could be. So uh, after we'd played, even if I'd not played the game particularly well, he'd, he'd go out of his way afterwards to say, well, you played the opening well, or, you know, Rook C6 was a good move, or so, something encouraging like that, which which I was very grateful to him for, and it really helps a partnership. Um, so I, I, I um, sort of liked him. I liked him for, for that um Behavior. As, as a partnership, we weren't um, quite as effective um, um, as we might have been. Um, um, partly, I think, because he's he's quite quiet. And when you, when you take these one minute breaks that you take in the in, in the consultation, just are extremely important. And what you need as an amateur is a fluent download of evaluations and moves and guidance on you know how to play the next phase of the game um and um uh ding was quite quiet and sort of he, he would spend the first 20 seconds sort of in fort thinking about the position i'm thinking come on come on we've only got we've only got 60 seconds talk to me talk to me. um um but but um a, a pleasure to play with him and actually um our, our our third game we did make good use of of the timeouts and um um we we achieved a um, that was mainly mainly his um, achievement, um, but uh, it, it was a bit of a masterpiece. The, the, the game that, that he and I played against uh, Nigel Povar and Gawain Gawain Jones, um, a lovely lovely attack, um, and uh, so that's that's a really great memory. Wow! Yeah, the whole thing sounds amazing. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. Oh, and um, and um, the last question yes so the the organizers the, the money goes to charity right um they're raising money for the chess in schools and communities charity in this country and, and the minimum bid um asked for is is two thousand pounds for the privilege of playing in the in the event with with one of these players so. okay well thanks for letting us know that um yeah i'm sure there's uh, a lot of listeners jealous um Terry, uh, I know I am of both your retirement and you're getting to play in events like this, but but thank you for sharing your experiences. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, and thanks for all the improvement tips and, and uh, we, we wish you con- continued luck. Um, is, there, is there anything else, Terry, you'd like to say before I let you go? Um, well, the last thought I had was was just how um wonderfully unfathomable this this chess journey is you know so uh, um i wanted to share one one thought with you with you on that but but the whole thing is is just much more difficult um and challenging than you ever thought it could be at the beginning and and that's that's a good thing i mean if if it was trivial or, or or bounded then it would be a much less rich part of all our of all our lives, um, just to give you one one example, I I'm I, I, looking at a book um, on the Moroxi structures by um, a couple of very well known trainers. Uh, Michal Chishin is one of them. Um, remember, oh, George Moore is the is the other, and and it, it looks. I have only had a superficial look at it so far. It looks like a very well organised um, educational book explaining different ways of playing Maroxy structures with white and with, and with black. And it, it, it gives the different plans and how they can, and, and it's very instructional. And, um, and you think, well, okay, I can learn how to play Maroxy structures from, from this. It, 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 um, it gives all the plans and, and typical games and so on. But then there's this, this throwaway remark in the book that actually these Maroxy structures, Gary Kasparov, really struggled with them in his career he never he never mastered them particularly well and he didn't have a particularly good track record playing against them and and natalie karpov and natalie karpov also had a poor record playing against the morosky structures 
so then you think but you know there's there's more to this you know it's not it's not just a just a question of mastering Maroxi structures you know it, 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 the game is kind of bigger than any of us um, um, so I, I found it quite remarkable that both of those players should have struggled with um, with with something um, and, and you know it you can work on it, but you're never going to get, you're never going to completely and Yeah, it. that is for sure. I mean, just look at what these computers are doing and how, and the gap between Magnus Carlsen, who's just, um, you know, un, unspeakable talent, just un, unimaginably good at chess and can't hold a candle to, to the stockfishes and alpha zeros of the world. Well, their horizons yeah, are as well. Just, yeah, just amazing. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, Terry, I don't know if um if people if you're like your information to be public, if people wanted to send you a note or keep up with you, or you're not on social media, are you? I'm not really on. I'm not active on social media. No, good, f- good I'm for not, you. But I'm, I've, I've got no objection, no objection at all to being to being contacted um by, by your listeners if if they have points they'd like to okay so with your permission i'll put the uh email address in the show description and uh and good luck i i I agree with you that i don't think this tournament in poland is going to happen but but whenever you get back out there i I wish you continued success to her yeah yeah strange strange times but then it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you for your questions and thanks to everyone who helps make perpetual chess possible that includes my producer matthew passy for his timely and capable editing chessable.com for their generous support of the show but i also want to thank everyone who helps spread the word about perpetual chess whether it be by telling a friend writing a positive review on spotify or youtube or we could use some new reviews on Apple Podcasts. If you're enjoying the show, please write a quick review. It helps spread the word about Perpetual Chess. But most of all, I want to thank the people who support the show financially. People who donate via PayPal or Patreon really help me continue to sustain and grow Perpetual Chess. And those who donate more than $5 a month get their name or entity's name read on the outro. That's about to happen right now. So I would like to give special thanks to the following people and entities for their generous support of perpetual chess they are chessable.com quality chess books the capital city chess club the apprentice twitch channel andrew bach austin clough benjamin porto kathy carr chad oliver dan o'hanlon danny davidson david schreiber i am dimitri schneider faras sawaf gary foreman greg natel greg shahadi guvin manet Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, Lone Pine Chess, Lorraine DeRay, Lucio Casada Silva, The Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Kahn, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Moonmaster 9000, Moonmaster, we need a question from you. Is everything okay? We need you to send in a listener question. Peter Sadi, Reuven Fisher, Seattle Chess Club. Thomas Donix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of Strong Chess, and Todd Kennedy. I would also like to thank the following Rook Level supporters. They include Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Andrew Perry, Anidi Deer, Better Chess Training, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Courtney Fry, David Bleskachak, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of the U.S. Chess Federation, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am elect or possibly not I am elect. I don't know if Three Norms makes him an I am elect. Donnie Ariel. Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Latart Lavoie, Frank Tortoris MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Schut, Harish Srinivasan, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Banastia, James Murr, Jason Anfang, Jason Willem, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Jerry Wells, J.J. Stranad, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jordan Goodwin, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, WGM Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Larry Ryforth, Laura Belyavsky, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org. 
Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Miguel Araspide, Mike Clem, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passaman, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbeck, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanic, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Wayne Beam, William Brock, William Juniper, William Hogarth, William Peterson, FM Zhao Jang of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, as always, for listening and interacting with the Perpetual Chess community, and I will catch you guys next week. Music.